I think it's an excellent idea for how new countries might join the euro. So Hungary ought to, could join the euro in the same way. It could, it could keep the florent for, uh, in that way, as an official currency, but all hand-to-hand -hand currency is euros, and then, and then it could just join the euro without waiting for anyone to, to ask it to join the club. Anyway, the euro is a great project. Uh, it's, it's going through its second biggest rethinking. I think the first, re, the first thinking of the euro, euro was almost good, but not quite good enough. And the problem there was being a little too muddy about bailouts. There's a no bailout clause, but then there was this treaty about deficits. And the problem with the deficit limits is saying anything at all. Because if I say to join the euro, you've got to keep your deficits below x, what I am implicitly saying is, by the way, that bailout clause, I'm going to be really tempted to bail out, so I want to keep you from getting in trouble with that. Well, if they had said nothing, then, they, then rack up all the debts you want. We don't care. We're not bailing you out. That might have been clear. In its second rethinking, we'll have to straighten that one out. Anyway, what I hope I've communicated in, in all three of these things is that at heart, inflation and deflation uh, uh, come down to fiscal commitments. And the heart of monetary arrangements and monetary affairs is, is the implied fiscal commitments. The challenge is how to communicate those fiscal commitments better than we have in the past, how to get ourselves away from something that looks like a stock pricing equation where inflation is, is at the same vagaries of long-term expectations that, that stock prices are. Uh, some of my ideas, like targeting the tip spread, uh, come down to ways of, of clarifying that stuff on the right-hand side and giving us a, a more stable um, set of monetary arrangements. I must admit, I am here as part of blatant self-promotion. If you're interested in what I've had to say, the general topic is fiscal theory of the price level. Uh, that's a partial list of things I've written about them, and there's my web page. Uh, so there's, there's lots more to say on this topic, and, but I hope, you find, um, I hope you find that framework useful, at least as a novel, if not a compelling way to understand the problems we all face now. So thank you very much. Can you take a couple of questions? As long as, good job. as long as anyone wants to stay. Thank you, John, for a very interesting lecture. Before, John will undertake a couple of questions, but before I want to thank, first of all, Adrian for having joined Nova in this event's presence, John Fonseca for having joined Nova in this lecture series. This is, good. this is only the first one of a series of lectures. And this was a wonderful session, the sound was great, and this was due to someone that's not often seen, is Maria João Rodrigues, without whom this would have been possible. Thank you very much, Maria João. I don't know if you are there, but you are there. Obrigado. <laughs> okay. Now questions. Okay. Now the hard part. Someone's got to have the courage to ask the first one. I know it's my class is always the same way. Yeah. I'll call on the back row. That's my usual technique, is I call on the back no. row. <laughs> I can't stop pointing at people to ask questions. That, that, no, no, no. I, I don't. Oh, I just wanted to. Yes. Um, so, so I didn't fully understand why you're so clear about uh, the impossibility of a fiscal union in Europe. Maybe you could talk about that a bit further. Oh, it's certainly perfectly possible. Um, but fiscal union means somebody else tells you what you get to spend your money on. Uh, so, do you really want that? A fiscal union, so a full fiscal union means you lose control of your budget. And if some bureaucrat in Brussels tells you, sorry guys, you know, you wanted to build a new port down here, and that's not in the budget this year because blah, 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 we're in charge. I mean, you know, full fiscal union means losing an awful lot of control over, uh, over what you do. Um, and yeah, and I mean, it, it, it means losing it to Brussels. It doesn't have to mean that every decision has to be made in Brussels, but for example, to have a corporate, uh, not a corporate, a common um, government bond market, that would be a first step towards that, no? Uh, yes, um, and, and uh, uh, well, you have a common government bond market. Oh, you mean just commingling bonds issued by every country? Yeah, but you really want to be in a fiscal union with Greece and they get to issue bonds that you have to pay off? Uh, so. 
it involves losing a lot of, of control over your policy and uh, at a very detailed level because debt isn't just government bonds. So it means you, know, you have to send in for review the retirement package you've promised all your government workers because that's just like debt in, in another form. So it's very intrusive. If you want to go for it, that works. Uh, you can also have a currency union without fiscal union. I like that banner because I like the idea of a, a very widespread euro. I was very annoyed in the airport to, in order to pay for my cab ride here. You know, I gotta, I gotta change dollars for euros and, and I lose a huge amount of, you know, it's just a pain to have all these different cur currencies and, and joining a common currency is, is a big benefit for international trade. So you could only, the currency union with fiscal union would have to be much smaller than a currency union without fiscal union. Without fiscal union, you can just tell, you know, all of Eastern Europe, sure, use the euro, fine, no problem. I mean, you know, you're on your own for your debts, but come join us. Um, yeah, and I want to ask you something more because I'm from Germany, actually. So um, I was wondering. Um, I'm so you're buying ex the drinks afterwards, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not an expert in, in this uh, whole matter, but do you really think your proposition would be a possibility that, that's seriously considered by, by the major forces in Europe? Is, is that a question about the validity of my proposition or about the major forces in Europe? <laughs> I have uh, a question and um, you want a comment from the The question is about this Francois uh, guy who uh, changed the livre into the EQ. I didn't get the last name, and I realize the first name is important in Chicago, but still, if you could give us the last name. Well, let me answer that so I can pay attention. Francois, Francois Velde is an economic historian oh. at the... Uh, oh, no, so you're talking about the author who told you about it. That was the, the author, French not the author. king. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, article in the journal Thanks. Political Economy. Now, let, me, let me give you um, a kind of a piece of information about the school here. Some of us, the old-timers, once wrote articles in the newspaper promoting liberalization in particular of the domestic scene, and we were called Chicago boys. Now, we were all uh, saltwater people, so in a way, uh, the thing I remember about the two authors you quoted, those I did uh, note the last name, Friedman and Woodford, I mean, when Friedman says inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, uh, here comes Woodford and says it's a fiscal phenomenon. Are you a minor post-Woodfordian? Am I? I Oh, this is a Samuelson quote, I'm sorry. You know, he called Marx a minor post-Ricardian. And I'm asking if you're a minor post-Woodfordian. Sorry, don't, uh, don't take it badly. It's a genuine question. Um, so this, the fiscal theory, uh, Mike Woodford in 1995 wrote a, a very good paper on the fiscal theory of the price level. Um, it has its roots in Adam Smith. Uh, Eric Leeper in 1991 wrote a, a pretty seminal thing on it. Woodford joined. Woodford then fell from the true faith. Uh, and became a New Keynesian. Uh, most of Woodford's book, um, so I've, I've looked it up, this, this equation appears in Woodford's book, it's in a footnote in chapter four, and he says, oh, by the way, uh, I'm just gonna wash this out by assuming the surplus is always a just ex post. So he became a New Keynesian, which is, is one of the other competing theories uh, of inflation. It is very much the, well, I have a, it's got its problems too. <laughs> It's basically a multiple equilibrium uh, sunspot theory of inflation. So uh, I'm, a, I'm certainly a disciple of the fiscal theory, and I would say Woodford has moved on to other things which you can either like or dislike, but it, uh, the, all of Woodford's book is, is very much not uh, fiscal, but in that New Keynesian tradition, which I'll say more about if anybody wants to hear it. Oh, here comes the hard question. No, 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 it's, well, I'll let you decide. Uh, I think you convincingly, uh, convincingly showed us the importance of not messing up too much with G and, 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 and trying to, to pump up G, the long-term growth rate of the economy, uh, uh, as, a, as a way of, of getting out of the crisis. What kind of policies do you think that entails? And, in what kind of difficult choices uh, you must face to, to, to pursue them? Um, I don't have anything deep to offer other than the sort of standard free market advice, get the heck out of the way. Um, so what, what causes you know, economies to grow over time is um, 
low taxes, uh, but above all, a, a consistent, clear tax regime that's not full of loopholes and special favors. Um, a, a deregulated environment, um, that seems to go with growth. Secure property rights, uh, no corruption. Um, I, I love that Hernando de Soto's book where he went around the world and said, found out what it took to start a dry cleaner, uh, a dry cleaning business. And in some countries, uh, the US was pretty good, it took 11 steps. Lots of other countries you had to go through months and months of permits and bribe all sorts of people and they wouldn't stay bribed and so forth. So. Uh, you know, clear property rights and, uh, and low corruption seems to be good. Intellectual capital seems to be good for if you want to grow and you're a small country, uh, the best way to do it is to bring uh, smart people from other places and, and encourage them to start competitive businesses. By that, I don't mean sort of big boondoggle projects, but, but an a environment where uh, people can come start businesses and, and make a lot of money on it. And, pay their share of low, simple taxes, and, and enjoy a happy life in good weather. Hmm, where did I just describe? Uh, you know, the growth is a, now, the problem, of course, is all that is politically contentious, because there are typically lots of vested interests, uh, big companies with monopolies, big companies with uh, state contacts. I don't know what's going on in Portugal. This is just around the world that don't want competition coming in, that, that want a highly regulated system. And the idea that business doesn't like regulation is, is wrong. Businesses love regulation because regulation means keep out the competition. So, you know, look, look what happened to airlines, for example. You may not like how they treat you, but boy, do they provide lots of stuff cheap and, and, and grow. So I, I won't go on beyond that because it's fairly simple and, and politically difficult. I, I should say, of course, investments in human capital are the best thing of all. <laughs> so um, great universities that attract talent from around the world. Now, I'm serious about that, and I'm, I'm not just plugging uh, plug, plugging my hosts, um, but I think that's objectively true. We're, you know, in, in the world, we are on a global search to get smart, talented people to come, develop together, and, and then and develop stuff in the countries where they go. And, and countries like my own are miserable at this. Right now, if you're a smart, talented person, you want to come to the U.S. and start a business, we say, well, welcome to the, uh, the TSA and the border control and immigration, and people just give up and go somewhere else. Uh, so, and universities play a big part in that. Great universities attract smart people to come and, and at least develop ideas and, and go on. So, invest in universities. How about that? Okay, Francesco, one last question, then the drinks. Yes, uh, I have a question about this equation, actually. Uh, Could you speak up? Okay, so uh, from, from your explanation, it appears that in, in this equation, the price level is the price of an asset, okay? Uh, and what is the empirical uh, evidence that we have that, you know, I see stock prices jumping, but I don't see the price level jump. Uh, so is there any empirical evidence that back this uh, view of the price level. When I think of the price level, uh, I'm coming from another school, as you might uh, have understood, I think of the price level as an index of many, many, many good prices. Okay. Well, the price level is, so it's the relative price of, uh, it's, it's exactly that index. So, you know, we, we take a whole bunch of goods and then we say, uh, you know, how much, is, how much is this thing worth in terms of a whole bunch of goods? Um, so, and since the discounted surpluses, you know, I'm taking the real values of those as well. I'm trying to, I'm trying to tease out where the difficulty is. No, I, I'm saying, sh sh shouldn't we see the price level jump? I okay, so do, one was what is the price level, and it's just, you know, the ratio of dollars to, or euros to goods. Now, jumps, uh, yes, um, that's a little bit what I was trying to get at with uh, this graph here. And let me, uh, let me re if you missed it and you're in the second row, that's a good chance to, so there's a second equation out there I didn't give you. So the equation I gave you, there it is, it's on the top of all slides but this one. That equation is true only when the, when the government ha rolls over short-term debt alone. There's no long-term debt. And then in that case, it is true. If the government only has short-term debt, then uh, it works just like stocks and we would predict the price level to follow a random walk. Uh, just like stocks do, which it seems not to do. It's, inflation seems to be smooth. 
Now, I could start waving my hands about price stickiness. One, another equation I haven't put down, you know, there's, there's some stickiness in prices. So we could add price stickiness to that to get at the empirical fact that prices move smoothly. But the other thing we, we can do is recognize the existence of long-term debt. Now, with long-term debt, that equation, it's modified and it's more complicated. And, uh, you know, when everyone wants a drink, I can't show you complicated equations. But the force of long-term debt is it gives, suppose there's an event which would give a price level jump. What the government can do instead is, oh my gosh, there's going to be a price level jump. What we will do is, is we will sell a lot of long-term debt to soak up that short-term debt. So we'll, we'll soak out the short-term debt. I'm trying to make this, okay. There's too much short-term debt and, and we're not having a rollover. So what we could do is soak up some of that by, selling long, by, by turning it to long-term debt. That pushes the inflation in the future. So, that inf so what you can do with long-term debt is, turn, is postpone the inflation that would otherwise come right away. And you can do stuff like what I graphed here, where there's a, so I graphed exactly, there's a shock in 2009 that otherwise would give a price level jump. But the government responded by selling a lot of long-term debt, postponing that and smoothing it into a smooth inflation rather than a jump. So you can do it, and I'm just going to have to say, go read the equations in the paper if, if you want to see exactly why. Okay. Thank you very now much. Now we've all earned a drink. Thank you very much. Uh, you are invited for a drink outside.